moving in with a girl when you're planning on leaving the country forever in like six months isn't really the best thing to do, you know. <laughs> Yo, everyone, welcome to episode 136. This is another long one. Check the timer. Um, it went longer than I thought it would, but lots of really um, interesting information, uh, helpful stuff for you. I'm really looking forward to listening back on this. Um, I, I talked about it before. We're going to change the format a little bit of the podcast. Not not extremely, but you know, try and make it a little bit tighter, a little bit more structured. Um, I give you the lowdown on that in the episode. Uh, we, you know, we finish up deciphering Japan. We talk about a lot of different concepts, the concept of kawaii and what that means inside, outside Japan. My thoughts of what that really means. Story time, um, housing, uh, just a, b a bunch of shit, like a crazy story, people to avoid, what, you know, some information about people to avoid in Japan and why my take on that and a whole bunch more. We got a lot in store for you. But before you do that, take a second, pause this, like, comment, subscribe. Please like, comment, subscribe, like, comment, subscribe, okay? Really, just trust me, it, it'll help everything out, make everything a lot better. It'll make the world a better place. But so after you do that, enjoy. Yo, 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 what's going on, everyone? Welcome to episode 137 of the podcast. I got another action-packed episode for you guys. I'm really happy to be here with you guys. Thank you guys for being here with me. Uh, it's been a pretty interesting week here in Japan. Um, fall is finally here. Summer's officially over. Uh, I got through the typhoon pretty much unscathed. It basically just bucked her right, like, er, and um, missed the Tokyo area. So uh, the weather was pretty nice. Really nothing to worry about uh, here. I got the beer I was talking about last time. This is like a Kirin uh, Ichiban Shibori, but it's a Kuronama. Which it's just like a half and half uh, Kirin beer. It's just really good. So I bought like four of them. I was like, I, I know these things aren't going to be here that long. So I just got to like get them while I can. Mm. Again, you know, I was, I was uh, texting my friend. I was like, seriously, like literally like 90% of the beer I drink in my everyday or alcohol in general of the alcohol I drink in my everyday life I drink on this fucking podcast like don't get the wrong idea like I mean when I go out like I went out the other day which is which is pretty nice uh with, with the family and everything but in my everyday life like literally like almost all of the fucking alcohol I drink is on this show which isn't really that much when you think about it so don't think I'm like woo booze cruising it up like every goddamn night which I'm really not um but for these motherfuckers like yeah I'm going to drink quite a few of these so um, so, so, so that's pretty much what's going on with, with the alcohol thing. I just get all self-conscious about it. I'm like, these motherfuckers gonna think I'm an alky, but, um, you know, whatever. I, I'm not like slamming these motherfuckers down. So, you know, I'm sure you know. All right. Mm. Mm. Oh, sorry. The fuck that's good. Okay. Um, <laughs> I told you in the last episode, like I was, I'm really enamored with this beer. I got a lot of things for you, for you guys, but, but before I want to, I want to talk a little shop. You probably know I'm, 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 I've been debating doing it for a while. Um, but I'm gonna do it. I think I'm gonna do it. Uh, I did, um, I'm gonna, ch you, well, you probably watch. If you're watching on YouTube, you already know, but I'm gonna change the intro. Um, no, no more of the little 2D animated thing. I, you, you can, if you noticed, I've been kind of phasing that out with my thumbnails and everything and, and get going more official podcast kind of shit on you guys. So, um, I'm probably gonna change the intro, uh, and just to the yellow board, make that my universal Japan according to Akio thing across the board. So, um, that's, that's one thing. Uh, another thing I wanted to bring up. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, uh, people on YouTube, you probably will also notice that, um, I'm, I'm, I'm really trying to format these episodes where, uh, you know, it's kind of clippable. I can kind of cut shit out. And so, you know, you, you, you will notice if you're subscribed that 
there um, are gonna be, you know, some more and more increasingly clips from the episodes popping up during the week. So if it, I, I forgot, I had to go back and label some of the episodes. I forgot to do it before, but um, from now on, I'll just be a little bit more conscious of if it's a full episode, letting you know that it's a full episode. And then if it's a clip, it'll just be labeled, you know, at whatever the topic is, just to make it a little bit easier for you guys. Uh, and so you think like, oh, Akil's got some new shit and then you're disappointed because it's just some shit you already seen or heard before. I know I kind of don't like it when that happens. So I'm going to try and be a little bit more um, aware of that for the 28 of you guys <laughs> but i appreciate all 28 of you guys and you know the two of you guys i, I we're, we're moving on up you know uh we got a couple of people uh regularly commenting and thank you guys I definitely appreciate it several likes popping off like i'm seeing it i'm seeing it um i'm really really appreciate it uh again like um, you know, now we're in the, the, I guess the, the podcast gold rush era, if you will. But I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not getting caught up in that shit. You know, I'm just really doing this because I love it. Uh, I like talking about Japan. You know, I like talking about things. I'm not going to like three, four days a week because I really don't think there is that much. I mean, there's a lot of stuff to talk about in Japan, but for me personally, like the way I do things, there isn't. Uh, you know, you know, there isn't enough competent for me to be talking like three, four days a week about like going all the, I'll burn myself way the fuck out. So, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do that. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, I, I enjoy this podcast. I enjoy the format, you know, but I am trying to improve it in the constraints of, of my everyday life and what I'm doing. And so make it, you know, uh, semi-professional, <laughs> if you were decent, <laughs> if you will. And, and, you know, if, if you guys have been with me, um, from the start, if you've gone back in and listened to the backlog, you, you know how this thing has developed over time. And I was thinking about it before I started recording that, you know, this is feels kind of like the start line of the official podcasts you know, activities by me, if you will. And it took me like 130 something episodes to kind of 120 something episodes to get here. But, you know, just figuring out my thumbnails and figuring out my labels and figuring out my intros. I just did a, did a outro for this episode. Just still stick around to the end. You'll see, well, it's not really anything special, but, 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 you know, um, those kind of standard kind of things, looking at other podcasts and realizing, oh, shit, I need to do that too. Oh, shit, I need to do that too. And just picking up stuff as I go along. So, um, yeah, yeah. So the intro is different. Uh, you know, the end of the video is going to be different. Uh, for people listening, uh, just strictly audio, nothing's really changing, but, um, the format again of, of the YouTube is going to change and I'm, I'm going to kind of try and structure things. So it is, uh, it will be in chunks, maybe one, two, three chunks that I can just kind of cut out. It doesn't, I realize it doesn't take me that much effort to just, you know, after I finish the episode, after I upload everything, um, which takes a little bit of time, but, and, you know, just to take like one small segment and just type a quick description and, and, and upload, it doesn't really take much effort for me. So, um, you know, with the Deciphering Japan uh, playlist, now I like kind of having, mixing my uh, opinion in with existing content on YouTube. So, uh, you know, I, I, as a discovery mechanism and just to catalog my opinion. So I'm, I'm definitely interested in doing that. A, a bit more so um this episode and in future episodes i'm gonna try to structure things <laughs> you know me structure things you yeah, okay <laughs> as i drink my beer right um mm. keep it right here but no um i am gonna try somewhat to kind of structure things a bit more in chunks and, and stay on topic a little bit more you know you know as much as i can uh, while doing my thing, but so those are kind of the efforts that I'm making to um, really keep step the podcast up to the next level. Um, and yeah, hopefully it'll pay off. Hopefully it can, you know, attract more eyes, get more people involved, um, you know, spread some my take on Japan and, you know, more of a community of people, uh, more topics coming in. Uh, you know, would, would be nice and, 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 you know, like we can kind of get vibes going and, and hopefully do some more fun things. 
we'll see, you know, but if it's just us rocking, let's keep this party going, you know, so, so that's pretty much it. Um, Rod, what you sent me, um, the core thing, I just realized I didn't, uh, I forgot to do research, to go through that in detail, so, uh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm gonna hold off and push that to the next episode, just letting you know. Uh, same thing with the, uh, faxes and <laughs> thing. Um, yeah, I, I'm aware of the issue. I, I, I messaged you, but, um, again, you can email me questions for keel at gmail.com whenever you want. Um, you know, I'll get it. I'll talk to you. It's all good. But yeah, that, um, that topic just, you know, I sent you a reply to that. Um, Oh yeah, another thing. Um, you know, Rod and Josh too. Uh, I, or Joshua, I should say. But um, like uh, I just to let you guys know, and anyone in the future as well. Like uh, I sometimes feel bad about the timing of my reply to your emails. I see them when they come in. I see comments when they come in. But I tend to like. You know, now we're kind of in the era where speed is the main thing and, you know, quick reply is the main thing. But I kind of want to sit down. It, it, to, I mean, now, you know, um, hopefully in the future, it'll get to the point where I have to speed through comments and I have to speed through emails or whatever. But I'm not there yet. So I kind of want to take my time and read through, you know, what's sent to me. And uh, even though it's just a couple of you guys, but. Um, so even, you know, if a comment or something comes in, I kind of like, if I check it, like where I'm on the run or doing my everyday stuff, I don't, uh, really check it until I have time to sit down and think about it, or I might just read it and think about it or, you know, like organize my thoughts and then how I think about how I'm going to reply to it or skim through it a little bit and then like take my time with it later. Um, so it does take me sometimes, some time to reply, but it's not because I'm brushing it off. It's just because like, for the most of the time, like I'm picking, I'm trying to pick the best time for me to sit down and write a reply, you know, if, if that makes any sense. So, um, I, I'm, I'm guessing you guys, you know, will understand that, but I just wanted to put it out there in the atmosphere for you guys and for anyone else, you know, who, um, takes the time to reply for me in, in the future. Like, um, you know, as long as the podcast is manageable, the you know, the content is manageable, you know, if it does take me a few days to get back to you, it's not like I'm blowing you off or anything. It's probably more like 95%. Like, I am just want to sit, you know, light a few candles, <laughs> sprinkle some rose petals on, on this sofa, you know, turn down the lights real low and, and, and get some red wine, you know, <laughs> and type in a nice romantic <laughs> reply to your shit. So that's all. All right. So, mm. before I do this, let me drink some beer. Hold on. Mm. I'm enjoying this so much. Oh my gosh. Like, uh, like Sapporo, you, you've seen me drink it, but Sapporo had like one of these, like I was telling, uh, my wife, like earlier, like Sapporo had like one of these type joints, like about, when I live in central Tokyo. So this was maybe like seven years ago, six or seven years ago. I remember this beer. It was just so good. It's like a half and half. Uh, I should pour this in a glass, but I'm not, it's just half and half. Like that's all it is. Mm. It was like Sapporo Black or something, and, you know. And I love that beer so much. It was like my number one beer for like, you know, four to six months. And I was just like, oh, thank you, Sapporo, every time. Like, oh, this is so good. This is my shit. This is my jam. And then it was just gone. You know, it's like one of those um, seasonal kind of beers that they just put out and then it just disappears forever. And I was just crushed buy it and i was like oh do you remember that sapporo black that shit was so good and it's just been gone forever i can't find it also this one you know i'm just cherishing this this is kieran another one of my favorite beers um and i'm just cherishing the fuck out of this so and it's giving me flashbacks of that support i still remember you know it came in tall boy bottles it came it came, it came in tall boy cans it came in bottles it was just so fucking good it was everywhere and then you know why you know um my wife was asking me well, like why don't they stick it or give, leave it around is because you know um it's a boost to their sales so they have their standard beers that they have but um and the same thing with sodas as well they come always coming out with funny flavors and shit like that because 
it's a boost for sales. So, um, you know, because it's temporary, it's like, oh, like, wow, we got to buy it. But if it was, you know, always there, then people wouldn't really give a fuck. So it doesn't really have the impact. So let me drink some more shit. <laughs> let me drink some more shit while I get, while I get the chance. Let me, uh, my baby. <laughs> mm. Mm, mm. Oh, oh, shit. Okay. All right, so here we go. So <laughs> this is uh, the first topic I have for you guys. Uh, again, please check the comments, check the description for the links to this. Um, there's an article and kind of two parts to a story. The news kind of, like I, I did a little bit of digging on this story. If you check the article, you'll get a completely different version of this story. So I don't really know what is the truth right now, but... Um, but there, so there are kind of two different versions of this, right? So one, it's about a rapper. The story is about a rapper, a Japanese rapper who sold everything he had and moved to, uh, America, flew to America so that he can meet his favorite group, Bone Thugs and Harmony. And if you know about Bone Thugs and Harmony, they're from East 99, it's where you find. Okay. <laughs> You know, late 90s, it was all about bone, 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 bone. <laughs> See you at the crossroads. Okay, anyway, anyway. Um, uh, so that's one of his favorite groups, apparently. So this dude, basically, he was like, fuck it. I'm going to meet Bone. So he sold all his shit, hopped on the airplane, flew to their hood, which is apparently like in Cleveland, East Nine, East Nine Nine is where you find, you know. Um, so he just flew there looking for Bone, and you know he he wanted a con, you know he it was his dream to meet them, so he got a record contract and all this shit. He wanted to get he wanted to get a record contract and. Um, he got robbed, you know, for all his shit. Of course, he landed in the hood looking for Bone Thugs and Harmony in like the hood in Cleveland and got robbed for all this shit. Was stranded in America and no way to get back to Japan is the story, right? <laughs> hilarious. Now, I mean, not hilarious that he got robbed, but just like, you know, I mean, I have heard of this type of behavior from people in the hip hop industry in Japan. Um, another YouTube channel, actually, I don't, maybe I talked about this dude before, but actually, I was talking to my wife about him a while ago, I just randomly found him, I think it's, the name of their YouTube channel, I think is Brooklyn Meets Japan, um, maybe Brooklyn Meets Japan, uh, just check the comments, let me, let me just make myself a quick note, uh, uh, I'll put, uh, it's actually a really nice YouTube channel. I watch it sometimes. Um, but uh, they're an international couple. Uh, she's, uh, you know, black woman. He's a Japanese dude. Uh, I think he's a producer or something like that. Um, but I think he, his story, he did the same thing. He just hot, went to America, couch surfed for a while, and just became like known in the hip hop industry as a producer and found his way. So I guess this is like a thing that some people do to make it. I wouldn't advise it to anyone at all. Of course not. Um, the dude who is in that YouTube channel that I'll, like I made a note, so I'll, uh, it should be in your comments. Um, he's a charismatic dude, really cool. You know, he kind of seems like he has some sense. This motherfucker is just like the type of the, and the reason why I chose this story is because this is the type of person. If you're into hip hop, you know, if you're a foreign person, you go to a hip hop club. This is the type of person you need to avoid at all costs. Right. This is the motherfucker who's going to see you. Yeah. You know, all in your face, talking some dumb shit, like, <laughs> talking dumb shit on a lot of different levels. And, you know, trying to connect with you and, you know, these are the people that will lead you down a path of bewilderment in Japan. You know, this is, this is what I'm talking about. And you can kind of tell from this guy, like from the news story or whatever, the article. Now, the article, what I read, like basically there was an Instagram post from Busy Bone. This happened like a year ago. It sounds like, you know, the news kind of make it. I think a bit more dramatic that, you know, his dream was to be a rapper, but the way he, the Instagram post from Busy Bone sounds like, it was like he partied with some Bone Thugs, performed in Japan, they partied with some dude, 
they were like, yo, come to America. He was like, cool. He probably couldn't speak English, you know, and he, they were just like, yo, where are you from? You know, we're from blah, 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 blah. Come check us out. No doubt, you know, maybe connected somehow. And then he was just like, fuck it, I'm going. These are my friends. And they just partied with the dude one night and he showed up. So they, you know, he probably just popped up on their doorstep and they were like, oh shit, what the fuck are you doing here? He couldn't really communicate. They got him a hotel room for a few weeks and then he's just like, I'm not going back to Japan. I'm staying here. I'm going to die in this bitch. And you know, like immigration is like, like, you know, it's just like, for me, this story, you know, one, the type of person who's into hip hop that, you know, you want to avoid. Two, um, a situation where the Japanese kind of never give up spirit, you know, gambare ba dekiru. Like, you know, if you try your hardest, you can do it. You can overcome anything. That's kind of part of the, the Japanese mentality here. And I've, you heard me say it kind of backfires, you know, sometimes. This is one of those instances where you just don't know when to give up. And this guy just doesn't know when to give up. And he's not smart enough to really realize that, you know, because he thinks like if he's got the passion, he's got the heart, you know, that he can just do it and he can live his dream. And, you know, he's going to... What the fuck you want me to tell you? Like... <laughs> <laughs> like dude come on now like you know so um yeah 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 you know it sounds good when you're talking with your crew like in somewhere in japan but to actually like make that type of shit happen it takes a little bit more up here and the dude in the other youtube channel he was able to do that you know and that's why i really had mad respect for that guy you can just see the way he carries himself he's he's really japanese like you know he's not like you know emulating what he thinks hip hop or American culture is like, he's, you know, like that, the dude in the other YouTube channel with the family, like that's the type of dude that I click, click with in Japan. Not, I mean, he has tattoos and all this shit, like not the external stuff, but just the way that he carries himself. It's clear, like he's himself, he's a Japanese dude, you know, but he understands people and he understands different places and he is able to adapt to a different situation you know and, and 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 do his thing and like i was having a conversation with one of my wife's friends the other day we went out for a while and you know same thing we were just shooting the shit like after my wife my son they left went back me and him we kicked it for like about four hours just talking you know um about business, about music, about life, about our history, stuff like, like a bunch of, and we had a great, like, he, it's not like he's a Japanese dude. He was just like a cool dude I'm kicking it with. And we've kicked it for years. And I'm like, you get it, you know? Uh, he's the same thing. That dude, he spent time in New York, worked for, for, you know, a clothing company and everything like that. And he gets it, you know? And so it's not like we're just two people talking. Like, you know, it doesn't feel like anything special. If you look at this kind of like Bone Thugs and Harmony dude, you can feel like he's like, yeah, you know, it's like, it's kind of feels externally feels forced, but people, the coolest people you, you know, here are people who just are just doing them, you know, and that's pretty much wherever you go, I'm pretty sure. Like find the people that are just doing them and they don't really look at you any other way. So, so that, I mean, it's an interesting story. It's a crazy story, but I think it gives some insight into uh, Japan, you know, the type, and I think a lot of contrast between those two different um, pieces of content. So I got to laugh out of the story, you know, um, I think in the, in the article, like the dude wasn't trying to go back to Japan. They were trying to kick his ass on the plane, but he just wasn't happening. It's, I don't know what the fuck happened to this dude. And, but you know, I ain't trying to run into him on the streets or wherever the fuck he lives, but <laughs> it's hilarious. So, all right. So, um, that's that. Ah, mm, 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 mm. Oh, Okay, I want to, <laughs> okay, I got some shit for you guys. Um, actually, a lot of this episode can get broken up into pieces now that I think about it. Uh, uh, okay, hold on, hold on one second, one second. Let me, let me cut this piece. Uh, ha, 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 ha. Okay.
Okay, let's get into real estate right in houses i mean because um i don't know why i randomly got this idea but um one one of the japanese shows that i really like is a show called before after and um you know it, it just got me thinking it just randomly popped into my head i was on the, on the train and um yeah so i was like let me see if there are some episodes of this thing online and there are and there are which is in, which are which is in your um description wherever you're watching this or listening to it so uh i just found a, a playlist of some episodes of this show pretty much it's like a, a home improvement uh tv show um and okay okay um make sure everything's all closed up <laughs> i get all parody like <laughs> whatever anyway um um what, 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 what do i want to say oh yeah yeah so this show so this show uh before after is pretty much a home improvement show and um what happens is like a family who lives in like an old house or a fucked up house or whatever pretty much it's just like an old fucked up house that they live in and you know they hire uh an architect to renovate their home and um they the show films it and then you know at the end they do the whole before the shit looked like this now the shit looks like this it's fucking amazing you know um it's literally before after like that's what the whole show is about um the whole thing is in japanese um uh, but uh i used to watch it even when, when like my japanese listening wasn't that good it's a pretty straightforward show like it's all in japanese but it, it's really elegant japanese as well so um, if you're like intermediate, like upper intermediate Japanese speaker or have listening skill, like let's say if you Japanese um, N2, for example, uh, you you should be able to follow the show. I would say N3, you know, uh, N3 Japanese, it might be a little bit tough. You might be able to pick up some of it. If you don't know, there are five levels to N, uh, the Japanese language proficiency test is what I'm talking about. So if you're like, what the fuck is N2, then you probably won't understand anything that's going on on this show. But um, there are five levels for the Japanese proficiency test and five, four, three, two, and one. One is like, you're just the shit. You, you might have heard me talk about it before. Like N2 is kind of what you need to really get a job interview to work for a Japanese company for the most part. Um, I passed N2 because I'm the shit. No, <laughs> I passed N2. I took N1 one time. Uh, and I was just like, okay, fuck this. I'm, I'm done with this. So uh, in the future, I'd like to get N1. But, it, you know, when I, now I'm focused on business and getting this cash, keeping these dreams alive, getting this cash. So after I do all that, then I'd like to go back and get N1 just to do it. But um, right now, it's just not a priority. Um, but anyway, so yeah, but this this show, even if you don't have, if you're interested in Japan, but you have zero Japanese ability, it's going to be an interesting show for you. And I recommend you watch it just because you can see, you know, construct Japanese construction. You can see the layout of Japanese homes. You can see what a modern home looks like. You can see what an old home looks like. And it kind of, I think that's what it was because it kind of ties into the previous episode of Deciphering Japan, where, um, episode three, I believe it was, of Deci Deciphering Japan, where they talked about, um, you know, ghost towns and, and uh, the efforts to get people, move people into uh, older homes. I think that might have sparked that idea in my in my mind so um yeah just go ahead and check out the playlist if you, if you want to you know see what like different types of japanese homes are like you know you can even watch it on mute if, if if the japanese is a distraction for you you can just play some music in the background and just watch the shit you know um it's, it's just interesting to watch right um I, i'm mesmerized by the show then the narrator's voice is is, is like totally like mesmerizes the fuck out of me and puts me to sleep half the time i used to just watch it and like take a nap <laughs> on my days off but like um it's just such a soothing ass show right um but um but yeah also you know i i have a bit more modern youtube uh video which is which walks you through a typical middle class home in japan i forgot the name of the youtuber i'm not gonna look okay, let me pay this guy his respect and actually find out his name um he does a lot of content i put some in my flip book uh his name is it this is uh life where i'm from is the name of the channel or the video yeah it's a pretty in-depth look at um is this a 
dodgy. Ah, that's what this is. Sorry, sorry. I misspoke. This is like, oh, yeah. Okay, fuck. I got to tell you. Story time. <laughs> Okay, let, let me finish this. So, and I'll tell you a story. So, um, yeah, I think I believe this is uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, look inside a Japanese danchi. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Inside, this is a look inside a Japanese danchi, and um, you know the layout of them and things like that. Okay, so check that out if you want if you, or the but the number one thing i recommend is before after um to really know a little bit more about you know japanese housing and housing construction layout and things like that mm. the um japan's housing for the middle class video that's the title of it is in english of course the other one is strictly in japanese so you definitely enjoy that now is story time okay I never told you, okay, let me get a beer. <laughs> you know, you already know. Let me finish this and get another beer. So just hold on. Okay, we are back, right? We are back. So, okay, so here we go. We're back. Mm. All right, so in the past, you've heard me talk about the story of where I decided to come to Japan, decided to stay in Japan. Um, you know, I talked to my dad and he said, just go follow your heart and all that shit. And, you know, I decided to stay here. That's the clean version of it, right? <laughs> Hopefully my wife doesn't get mad at me for telling this story. But, you know, yeah, she, she will. She won't because, you know, I was kind of like an immature asshole. Um, pretty much. Okay, so this is like 2006. I remember it well. So I was like 24. Um... And, you know, it, I, at this point, I was in a full-on relationship with my wife. Um, you know, we were serious. I would definitely say I was in love. You know, we were dating for two years at this time. A year, a year and a half, almost two years. I was I was definitely much in love with my wife at this point. You know, who I would say was my first serious relationship. Um, My first serious adult relationship, especially for that long. Hmm. Um, sorry, I had something in my teeth. <laughs> like, I mean, you know, I'm not saying I was a player player, but, um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of young, a lot of young men. I had definitely had a fear of commitment for a lot of different reasons when, you know, growing up as a teen and, um, as in my early twenties, um, but just me and my wife, especially being here and, you know, just over the course of just getting to know her and, and stuff like that, I allowed myself, I think, to open up. She got within, you know, we broke up several times, but, you know, eventually she got under my guard and, and you know, I opened up to her, you know, and, and she got under my armor and, and I opened up to her and I fell in love, you know, and I was really happy with her. But at 24 years old, being in Japan for a couple of years, the question of when do I go back to America was really looming in my head, right? Now, um, during this time, um, she, um, long story short, I won't get into all the details, but basically, um, uh, my wife had a friend who had an apartment. Now, an apartment in a danchi, which was a really cheap danchi, right? It was really cheap. A really cheap place to live in. Um, again, I won't give all the details just because, you know. But anyway. So, her friend uh, was moving to another country and uh, for uh, some time. And basically was like, you know, um, can, you know, I, I want to keep this place because it's a really, really, really affordable place. So, you know, if you guys will live in it, basically it was like, if we live in it, we move there, um, and pay the rent, you know, it's a win, win, win for everyone. So, um, I was like, all right, cool. I was living in a guest house at the time. I'd been living in that guest house for a bit over a year, you know, um, I was like, cool. I was kind of like, you know, go with the flow kind of mid twenties guy. You can imagine, right? Like, yeah, let's do it. Like, it's all good, babe. I love you. Uh, I can't remember if I was telling my wife I loved her at that point. Probably, probably, probably. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. 
so um we decided you know i decided to move out of my guest house and move into this uh donchi it was a fucking donchi like you're probably seeing the thing it's like an old school apartment complex um you know not that well lit <laughs> not that big the bathroom was i mean that's the toilet room the toilet room was you know the the shower was concrete and like you had to like squeeze through the kitchen to get in and take a shower it was dark like it was, it was just the layout was completely fucked up basically you know and i think that's how a lot of donjis were at that time like it wasn't really optimized for like everyday living it's like you got a kitchen you got a fucking shower you got a toilet you got a door you got a bedroom and that was it you know so um um so <laughs> before um i'm moving in like i remember like yeah because i moved in around spring like around april or may and i forgot what my wife and i were checking in like a um internet cafe but i remember it was it was cherry blossom seed just to let you know um yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I remember what the fuck. I was on some shit. She, she, she doesn't let me forget this at all either. Because, like, I had decided already that I was going to go back to America. I just put an arbitrary deadline. I was like, I'm going back to America in October. When I think when my visa is up, I'm, I'm just going, right? Like, that was my thing. So, this was, like, April. I was like, fuck it, I'm going. So, um, I told my wife, I told her, like, look, we're dating. I love you. Yeah, I think I did tour. I love you, but I gotta go back to America. So, you know, normally how that thing goes is like, we'll stay in touch. We'll figure it out. We'll be okay. You know, I love you. Mm, that kind of thing. It's kind of normally what happens. Of course, the guy has the best intentions of, of keeping it going, but in reality, come on now. You know how it's gonna work itself out, right? So, so I was like, all right, you know, uh, we were in an internet cafe or something like that, getting, looking at stuff for the movie. <laughs> I was just such an immature asshole because like, I just remember sitting there next to my wife. She was checking, I think, moving places or something like that in the internet cafe. Okay, this is before smartphones, of course. And like, um, the internet cafe had an arcade, right? And I was just kind of like, they have virtual cop downstairs like <laughs> they had time cop we walked past like the game room and they had like time cop down there and i was just like oh. and it was like free and i was just like oh shit and, you know i just had to sit next to my wife <laughs> basically <laughs> i had to sit next to her while she checks shit on in japanese and i'm just like sitting there useless and i'm like I just want to go downstairs and play video games right now. <laughs> and I was just trying to find a way that I could just, because it was like, it took her a long time. She was checking shit. I was just like trying to find the smoothest way where I could just be like, yeah, you just do all this. I'm going to go downstairs and play video games. Right. And like It's cool. But needless, needless to say, I didn't, I, I didn't touch that fucking time cop game at all, which one of the regrets in my life. Right. Hmm. So, so I just, I don't really remember what we were talking about, but I remember she, her working hard, trying to figure some shit out. And I remember after a while, I was like, look, man, just like, whatever, we'll just, you know, we'll figure it out. Like, let's just call it quits for today and go sit under the cherry blossoms. <laughs> You know, go, go sit under the cherry blossom trees. It was cherry blossom season. I was like, you know, and she was like, what? What the fuck are you talking about? I'm like, look, this is my last cherry blossom season in Japan. I'm trying to enjoy it with you. So come on, let's just get out of here. Go do something fun and chill and not spend all of our time trying to figure out this moving bullshit. Yeah, that was that was my philosophy at that time, you know, because <laughs> I'm in fantasy land. I'm, it's Japan. I'm having fun. Woo, I'm enjoying my life, you know. So needless to say that with that frame of mind, like, um, <laughs> the day, um, you know, um, I, I, I leave my, my, my guest house. Like, I think some of my shit was moved. I, I don't know what the logistics of what happened, but I just remember I had a big ass suitcase with the shit and I put it on a commuter train 
and I rode that bitch like across Tokyo because I live in northern Tokyo and this was like in I think in like western Tokyo you know southwestern Tokyo so I had to ride ride the commuter train with a big ass suitcase like an hour and a half across Tokyo you know full of shit which is not fun so I finally get to the place and I'm like you know I get there I got the key I unlock it and I'm like where's my wife you know oh she's my girl where's my girl where's she at you know so I call her I'm like yo where you at and she starts crying her eyes out to me and she's just like I can't do this like I can't do this no I can't you know and so she breaks up with me basically <laughs> basically you know it didn't really dawn on me at the time that you know moving in with a girl when you're planning on leaving the country forever in like six months isn't really the best thing to do you know <laughs> that's not really the best strategy at all so but again like this is what i'm telling you guys like i had my western thinking like hey we're young it's not that serious you know, let's just enjoy right now. And then whatever happens, happens. And, you know, hey, you'll be all right. But again, a Japanese girl, you know, who's 24, 25, hitting that mid 20s in a serious relationship with a dude is in a completely different thought process. You know, if a, if you become boyfriend and girlfriend with a girl here, like and y'all date for more than six months, even more than three months, even after the first date, automatically she's thinking about marrying you. You know, that's what I would say. Or the potential of her marrying you. Or what her life would be like marrying you. That's, um, Japan is a very much relationship, married, marriage-centric kind of country. Especially for women. Like, even if, I don't care if you have a one-night stand with somebody. If you have a one-night stand with somebody, that girl probably thinks, you know, she likes you. And there's some possibility of you guys becoming boyfriend and girlfriend at some, if it goes well, right? If it's just like drunken, sloppy sex, like, you know, a, you know, then maybe it just might be like, all right, peace. But I'm pretty sure she'll like you at some point a lot more than you would like her, right? Like, that's just the way it goes now. I can't really imagine like the, av the average Japanese girl just, you know, doing her thing, like, doing like, uh, I don't really know what city girl means, you know, or hot, I know what hot girl summer means, cause, you know, but I guess the city girl is just like same thing like a hot girl summer. I sound like such an old, <laughs> I sound like such an old person right now. I'm like, what do y'all young whippersnappers mean by hot girl summer? <laughs> but I don't know. So it's like a city girl, hot girl summer kind of thing. I don't know. I don't know the fuck y'all talk about in the West anymore. Like I'm completely out of touch. Right. But, um, but yeah, so you're not going to get that in Japan, right? So just keep that in, in mind, right? Even if you have a one night stand, in her mind, she's thinking about a relationship. So, um, so anyway, so my wife basically dumps me and I'm sitting in this fucking donji, like <laughs> by myself, which is like far from the station, at the bottom of this big ass hill, like huge hill like we, like my my wife and i we, we went there you know the first day to check out the place and i was like all right it's all right but i was like damn look at this hill you know <laughs> i was like yo this hill is kind of crazy walking to the station every day is gonna be kind of crazy but we kind of laughed about it i was like all right whatever now i moved in like april or may if you if you remember what i said about weather in japan rainy season comes then summer comes right so and you know summer we just finished summer summer is no joke in japan so what ended up happening was like mm, i my and, and the school that i worked at at the time was like i want to say if i remember correctly about an hour on the train because i think it was like for two trains it was like 40 minutes or 40 minutes or some shit like that it was a little long ass time basically it took me an hour and a half door to door to get to my to work so i had a three hour round trip commute to work every day 
in a don a old ass donchi, like a probably sixty year old donchi, alone, with when my girlfriend just fucking dumped me, like, yeah, <laughs> that summer was was not the best, right? And, and if and if you remember, I think I told stories about you know meeting people i think i told a story about this chick I, I met in a nightclub and i went out you know and then the crazy weird obsessed guy that she was with this was all this summer when all this shit was happening you know i was very much in a transition period trying to figure out what the fuck i was gonna do it was a very weird summer in my life right um but but yeah so <laughs> so that summer living in that don sheet like and it was kind of weird too because like i wasn't technically supposed to be there because you know my wife's family's kind of subleasing the place so it was like hey akil don't let anyone see you coming in and out of the place like so i'm like a fucking ninja going in and out of this donchi i'm like you know like not making any noise and like one time I actually like fucked up some things because it was like <laughs> i fucked up some shit real bad because <laughs> like it was like um the washing machine was on the balcony and I really didn't know what the fuck I was doing. So I was like, wash my clothes one time, but it was like a, a hole where like, you know, the, the drain goes where like the, the plug for like the water from the washing machine goes. But like somehow I set the laundry, but I didn't really pay attention. And so the hole was plugged up. So laundry water basically one day overflowed and flowed over the balcony. And then like um, one of the neighbors came out and was like yelling at me in Japanese, but I couldn't speak Japanese well enough because I just was studying. I just started studying Japanese at that that year, right? Like my second year in Japan is when I started studying Japanese. So my Japanese, was, I was just like, oh shit, you know. He, I saw him down there. Like I was like, fuck, he saw me. Oh my gosh, but you know, whatever. Um, <laughs> any, shit, any shit I could do. Um, I think you know her friend was. Uh, dating a dude who was black at the time, or I don't know, I forgot the details, but she at some point lived with someone who was black. So I was like, hopefully he thinks I'm that other dude. You know, he's just like, yes, yeah, a black dude up there. So I was just like, whatever, you know, I just like didn't go outside. <laughs> I was just like paranoid inside the house alone. Like, fuck, are they gonna come get me? Like, what the fuck is gonna, you know, I don't know. And you know, the, my only line of communication is my ex-girlfriend, you know, so I have to kind of talk to her. It was, it was just a weird situation. But basically that summer, like every day, my commute, my like I had to walk up this like huge hill. Like you have no idea. It was like, it wasn't like one hill. It was like a huge alpine, like hike fucking hill. Then like another longer hill that like winds around this road. And then I can get to the main road and then walk to the station. Like it, it was a, like, like a strong 20 minutes, you know, fucking hiking my ass off in the middle of summer in Japan. Like, but the good news was, um, I remember because I had such a long commute and I started studying Japanese, I would just study. So I would hike my ass up that big ass hill get on the train it was only two lines and, and it was during the day so it wasn't really anyone there so um i would just study japanese on the train you know and i was just like it was like i think 20 minutes or 30 minutes yeah that's what i think it was 30 an hour on the train so it was like 20 30 minutes to get to the station and then another um hour on the train so i had 30 minutes each line you know i, I could get like a good half an hour study each train line so i got like about an hour you know going back i can't remember if i studied excuse me sorry but you know um let's say an hour or two study each way maybe study some more when i got back in the fucking house because i really didn't have anything to do except watch japanese tv um <laughs> just remember something else and um do that you know <laughs> also at the time like my hair i realized my hair was <laughs> I was losing my hair too. I just realized it. So I used to cut my hair. So like one time um, I cut my hair and that was the first time it looked, it didn't look right. And I was like, oh shit, I'm going bald. Like, oh fuck. So I was like, I got no girl. I got no place. I'm fucking got no hair. Like, fuck. <laughs> so I had to like, that was the first time I shaved my head. And I shaved my head. 
and I just completely massacred my head. And it was just like blood everywhere. <laughs> just like, yeah. <laughs> so like I was having a fucking nervous breakdown in Japan, basically. <laughs> I mean, I can laugh about it now, you know, but, um, I, yeah, I was pretty down. You can imagine, like, I was pretty down <laughs> that summer. And, um, you know, then, you know, by myself, I really wasn't, I was so far away from everything. I really wasn't going out, um, my skid, the way, especially the way my schedule was. And, and I just well, didn't have the mood to go out because I was like, you know, um, I, I think I talked to my dad and I decided to stay and I was like, I'm gonna, I'm going to wait for her and, you know, my wife and figure out what I wanted to do and stuff like that. Like, so, um, <laughs> yeah, so, uh, that was just a wild fucking experience, you know, um, I mean, it worked out, you know, and, and then like, you know, I just, threw, if you remember, I talked about taking a night bus to Kyoto. That was why I took the night bus to Kyoto. You know, my, my coworkers are worried about me because I was just sitting there just like, fuck. You know, normally happy, fun, loving a keel is just like between lessons, just sitting there staring off in the space, not saying shit for like a couple of weeks. And it's just like, is he all right? You know, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> I'm just in my thoughts, like, you know, and so. And then one day I'm just like, I'm going to Kyoto. Like, you know, and, but I do shit like that. I'm just like, I, to, 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 if I'm, you know, once I go down, I'm ready to reset. I just gotta like do something to thrust myself into reset everything. So I think that trip to Kyoto was my time to really wake up and be like, okay, I'm through feeling crappy for myself. And then I started slowly going out and I started meeting people again and, you know, um, slowly dating again and stuff like that. But you know, then my my wife caught me. You know, she came back looking all good. I think she took a trip somewhere too. And then she came back looking all good, smelling all good. And I was like, damn, damn, you got me, girl. <laughs> you got me. And, and you know, and, and hey, now we're married and we're you're happy. You know, we got a beautiful son and it's all good. So, mm. but that summer of two thousand six was probably a defining moment in my life you know um like i said the best advice i got from my dad you know he gave me like perfect timing he gave it to me um so thank you dad thank you so much for that uh and also just you know uh, just a character building summer so that's when i think about a donchi i think about that experience <laughs> <laughs> I would not want to repeat it. I can remember exactly what that place looked like, you know, like me living in fucking my wife's friend's place, looking at her friend's clothes, you know, then, oh yeah, I started working out again and shit too. So I'm like going crazy, you know, <laughs> I'm doing push-ups in this door. <laughs> I'm doing push-ups by myself, like, in this fucking donji, like, got the weights, like, what the fuck, you know, because I think there were some weights from, like, um, her friend's boyfriend or whatever, and I'm just like, you know, I start going to the pool, and I'm doing all this shit, like, getting all my aggression out, like, <laughs> it's fucking crazy, like, what the fuck, man, <laughs> but, you know, it worked out, it worked out, so, that's my donchi memory, but go, okay. but go go ahead and uh, check out that um, those links. Okay. Uh, oh fuck! I got two. More. This is another. This is gonna be another long episode. Mm. Mm. Beer time, hopeful. Mm. 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 Fuck, that's good. Ugh. It just I'm just because it just tastes so similar to that Sapporo man. It just brings me just good memories okay um let, let, let's get into deciphering japan uh the last episode of deciphering japan um i think so i think it's the last one yeah yeah it is it's the last episode of deciphering japan episode four um this one is not so controversial it is it isn't i'm gonna do this one out of order because, uh, okay, no, I won't. I'll just go through it in the order. Like, I took my notes in the order that it is. But, but especially the first part of it, I'm not going to put too much detail in because it 
branches off into the final topic I want to talk about in this episode. Um, so the first episode, uh, this episode really, the first topic that they talk about is kind of kawaii and the concept of kawaii. And they, it's set in the kawaii monster hotel in her, in, in the kawaii monster cafe in Harajuku. Um, which I, you've probably heard me say that, uh, my mentor, my friend, um, is in the restaurant industry and he, I remember he told me, you know, he sent me pictures from the Kawaii Monster Cafe because he went to the opening <laughs> and, you know, his, he was just like, you know how much their money they spent building this motherfucker? And he just kind of broke down to me, like the price and he was like, this shit, you know, fuck, like, you know, <laughs> basically, um, saying like the business model for it is kind of fucked, <laughs> basically, and, and, you know, um, there's no way they're going to recoup the amount of money that they spent, that the company spent making this place, but he had fun running around the place, you know, before they, they opened like several years ago, um, they, they, I'm going to talk in a in, in a bit about the concept of kawaii and how I feel like it's been kind of skewed, especially for foreign people. So I'm going to hold off on that. But definitely just know there is a huge difference between the everyday concept of kawaii and the what kawaii means outside of Japan, right? Completely fucking night and day. Like, the shit that... It, Japanophiles living outside of Japan think kawaii is is fucking weird to me. Like I'm like, what the fuck are y'all looking at? I mean, it's not wrong, but it's not. What's the word? It's not normal. <laughs> For lack of a better word, not normal, but it's not standard. It's not like okay, okay. If you ask, like I said, like someone who's really into Japan, I'll just call you a Japanophile for lack of a better word, a Japanophile from another country, what is kawaii? And you ask like an everyday Japanese person, what is kawaii? You'll get completely different answers, generally speaking, completely different answers. And you know, what I think is misleading is like the kawaii cafe, Made, you know, the Kawaii Monster Cafe and Kari Pamyu Pamyu and Harajuku outside of Japan is kind of the um, generally accepted image of what Kawaii is. But it really isn't, you know. Uh, that's what it's thought to be. Let me make sure this is recording. Hold on. Okay, okay. Yeah, and, and, and that is, I think, a very... Um, not dangerous is too much of a, too overly dramatic, melodramatic word, but it, it, it's a, um, misleading thing, right? It, it's a very misleading thing. And, um, it, it's economically good. It sells tickets, you know, it, it, it sells, you know, it gets butts in the seats. It gets people on airplanes to come to Japan and it gets people to go to expos and it's fun, right? It's, it's fantasy, but it's not <clears throat> the core of what, it's not the core of what kawaii is in Japan. It's just not, right? And, and that's kind of what I want to talk about a little bit later. So hold on for that. Um, so, so, um, later on, um, in the episode, they talk about half Japanese people, mixed people. Um, you've kind of heard me talk about this, you know, about me, my son, my personal experience as well, my thoughts on this. Um, so I'm not, I don't really have too much to add to that, like in this, like in this episode, but I, I do want you, um, to know that for me, um, one important thing to understand with, about uh, the people in this episode is that they're talking from the fashion industry, right? And as you can probably imagine, the fashion industry is a very completely different industry than everyday life in Japan. What they're saying is, I'm not, in the, I'm not trying to um, invalidate what they're saying. It's true, but some of their opinions and views trying to break into the fashion industry as a half Japanese person, I think that's where you get, you know, the kind of white is right kind of thing, which I agree with them on, like, you know, as far as that industry goes. 
but um trying to go the mainstream you know high fashion route for example that's kind of what you're going to encounter and i think that's not only true in japan that's true like uh, not so much recently and uh, not so much recently because you know uh, urban culture has kind of become the cash cow for high fashion right you know um so um Mm, or let's say not not uh, knockoff is, is 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 too much of a condescending way of saying it, but the um finally the acknowledgement, not acceptance, but the acknowledgement of the influence of urban culture um, has become the cash cow of high fashion, right? Yeah, and so um, in a sense, like it had, high fashion has become a lot more inclusive than it was, let's say like 20 years ago, 30 years ago. But um, but there is still that kind of hierarchy, if you will. I'm sure even if you're not into fashion, you can feel it and you know it exists. So, so the same thing, even more intensified is, is true in Japan because again, things that are uh, established trends outside of Japan are even more intensified when they come into Japan, right? Um, so just take that with a grain of salt. I don't really have too much else to add to that. The nationalist um, thing, like, you know, for me, it's interesting because, um, yeah, like, I, I, I right-wingers are, are a thing here. Um, it's, you know, uh, again, I'm not gonna get too deep into the dynamic because it's a lot deeper than I can say. You know, again, I'm an outsider here, uh, so I can't really get too deep into it myself. But I do think that um, it's interesting that, um, you know, a lot of the right wingers overtly say things that in some form or another exist in Japan unknowingly. Right. Like right wingers are saying we don't want foreign people here, like especially the people here, like we don't want foreign people here. And Japanese people generally don't think like that on the surface. But, but at the same time, like Japanese people might start to feel uncomfortable if there are too many foreign people moving into their neighborhood, right? Or if there are too many tourists, or like if they feel like the Japanese-ness is being drained away from their everyday life that might make them uncomfortable. And I mean, naturally so. I'm not like blaming them at all, but um, living in Japan is kind of like, that's one of the conundrums of this country. It's like, you know, you have to really, you know, that self-awareness of some of the hangups that Japanese people have isn't really there. You know, um, people aren't really aware of the fact that they are kind of, I mean, people are aware that there are islands country and island civilization, you'll hear Japanese people acknowledge that very much so. But the willingness to let, but you know, acknowledging that that's your hang up and being willing to let go of that hang up are two, two completely different things. A lot of Japanese people are very much aware that, hey, we're island nation, we're, you know, we're isolated, this is us, but okay, yeah, so are you gonna change this shit? that's a completely different conversation that people get really uncomfortable about. So for me, um, I mean, of course, like right wingers like that, they very much are fringe, even a lot more so than for example, in America. Um, even just look, look, you know, not only what the guy says, look at like the footage of their like rally or whatever the fuck it was. It's like a old dude and someone walking their dog, just looking at them all crazy from the station. That's pretty much what you see, you know, um, in the Tokyo area. I don't know about other areas. I don't know about the countryside, but that's pretty much what you see. The reaction, the same reaction that you get. It's like, oh, okay, whatever. You know, and again, gen generally speaking, like, making a ruckus disturbing the peace is something that's looked negatively upon regardless of what the fuck you're saying so um yeah but for me you know um the hang the hang-ups that japanese society does have about foreign people that go unsaid unspoken unrecognized is something that i would like to see um brought to the forefront and discussed and not only discussed but actually resolved you know, in a more inclusive way, 
I don't know what that way is because, uh, you know, I'm not just, I'm on the outside looking in. And that's something that kind of is in-house business that needs to be handled by Japanese people. I don't know how they would resolve that at all, but, you know, it's something that I'd like to see done uh, at some point in the future. Um, oh, yeah. can The parents will mix kids in Ibaraki. Um, I don't really have that much to add to that besides the fact that for me watching that family, they look like a happy family. But for me, looking at the kids, the kids are very much being raised as Japanese to me is kind of what it feels like. You know, it seems like if I look at those kids, like I would imagine 80, maybe 90 percent, they're Japanese versus like taking on the characteristics of the dad. And again, it is a very tr tricky thing. Like my son so far, he's he's only three, but he's like straddling that line very well because, you know, he's getting 200 percent of those things. And, and I'm very proud watching him switch between people, between cultures, between languages, between his atmosphere, you know, and I mean, finding his way so far is still very early in the game. But um, I'm happy the way he's playing in the first, first quarter, you know, um, when he hits elementary school, it's going to be a different thing. I got to keep tabs on it even more so. Um, but but, you know, because they live in Ibaraki, um, because they're so far outside, which is kind of the countryside, um, I, I'm curious to know how much African culture, how much black culture is in those kids beyond what they look like is kind of, you know, and for me that that's kind of a big thing. I, because I mean, I, I believe my this is only my theory that you know without the proper acknowledgement recognition and education of a young kid who's mixed especially growing up in japan and can't speak to everyone else you know you're taught to believe like you're like everyone else you're japanese but it's clear it's like one of these things doesn't belong you know not in a negative way but it's like you know look at look you know okay you, you know you got what pale skin, pale skin, pale skin, dark skin. Psh. Like it's not rocket science. So if you tell it, like, kids aren't stupid. Like if you tell a kid or treat them the same as everyone else, even if on the surface you do, they know they're different from everyone else. It does, you know, there is a double consciousness kind of thing that goes on that people I think don't recognize and don't acknowledge. But so like, even if like you want them to be like everyone else, you treat them in like everyone else, they know they're different. And the older that they get, the more they're going to understand that. And it, those questions are gonna start to eat up at them. Cause it's like, am I the only one that's crazy that sees like, I I look different from the rest of you? It's like, you know, I keep, it sounds kind of negative. I keep, it's like the ugly duckling. It's like, I know I'm different from you guys. So, um, you know, being able to, from the jump, tell my son, you're different, <laughs> you know, it's fine, but you're different, you know, and, you know, this is why, and it's not a bad thing, you know, it's actually a very good thing, and you have other responsibilities and things you need to be aware of because of it, that's all, deal with it, you'll be all right, you know, it's not a big deal. You don't need to be like, oh my God, like, oh my God. Like, no, like, but, but, you know, and, and whatever the challenges come, I hope as a parent, I'm, I'm equipped to handle it and, and make my son, you know, um, go through whatever difficulties he might have with a sense of pride, a sense of, you know, self-confidence to be able to not avoid any of those issues, but to overcome them, you know, so um that's my only concern about about that type of situation so i don't know take it take it is take it is what you, what you will um handicapped people in japan uh i i can't really speak on this too too much but yeah uh, you know japan i've talked about before japan is not Anything outside of the ordinary Japanese society kind of not necessarily shuns, but shies away from, you know, um, on all levels, right? So that's another issue that I think is, 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 is needs to be addressed in Japan to be more inclusive. Um, that's kind of all I can really say about that. Um, the last thing I want to say is the Buddhist monk um with bars and bands and stuff like that i'm not gonna lie i kind of skipped forward a little bit i, I realized i didn't watch that final part 
Um, and I just wasn't really, I just looked at it, I was like, okay, and eh. but, but you know, um, it might seem cool, well, Buddhist monk has like a bar and things like that. For me, like again, Japan is not a religious country. Like traditions, ceremonies play a very important part of everyday life here. But Japanese people aren't, surprisingly, aren't generally that religious. Like, there are Christians here, there are other, a lot of other religions, but on average, your average person is not going to be religious at all. I've heard lots of people even challenge the fact whether there is a God, might be atheist. Not necessarily like they have a hardline stance against God, but just like people are so focused on their everyday life here. Anything beyond that kind of gets pushed to the periphery or even like... Eh, I don't even really think that eh, it doesn't matter or I can't really see that happening. You know, faith in the unknown isn't really something that's a that's a strong motivator in the everyday lives of Japanese people. It just isn't, you know. So even though, you know, you have people who might, um, what's the word, might do, do on be involved highly with a lot of religious ceremonies, it doesn't really have a spiritual meaning to, I would say, the majority of people partic actively participating in them. Rituals, ceremonies, are, you know, history, tradition, very much strongly ingrained in Japan. The importance of religion, eh, not so much, you know. And so that, see me seeing, this reason, part of the reason why I skipped through that is because seeing that monk have his bar, for me, maybe he might not see it as that, but for me, his customers, it's just a theme. It's just another, you know, go to like, I mean, I, I'm not equating the two together, but, you know, go to a hostess bar, go to a titty bar, eh, go to the Buddhist bar. It's like another exciting new theme to go there for. That's all it is to attract people. Same thing with the band. They're not like, yeah, religion. They're just like, okay, this is something, a new, a subculture, a theme lack for lack of a better word gimmick a hook to get to get pe people in you know um and i would be kind of skeptical as to the w ability to actually meaningful meaningfully get those patrons interested in their religion you know versus like you know in the west especially in christianity i'll say um, you know, that's a, a thing where you can kind of hook in young people with music. You can hook in young people, not with bars, but like maybe with like music or some other shit, you know, is the kind of the hook that, that you can see, you see religions use to get kind of young people to participate and become active in. But in Japan, eh, I think it's just like a way to get kind of butts in the seats and keep the business going as well as say, <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, it's really not that deep. Mm. But okay, but in general, decipher. I think that sums up, that wraps up Deciphering Japan. Again, for me, a great series. I kind of gave a cr critique of it, my perspective on it, but by no means don't, don't let those critiques um, downplay how entertaining and how informative I thought that docu series was and is. And I def if you if you're only watching this video or listening to this, I definitely encourage you to watch the whole thing. Give it likes, give it props. It definitely gets my boom stamp of approval. I just wanted you to also take a different perspective going into it as well, so that you can also extract. I think the most meaningful. Uh, core information from that as possible okay okay all right that's that's that all right how much ooh, fuck this what what the fuck am i doing this is like an hour and a half god damn okay mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm. telling stories about my sordid past is what the fuck this shit gets me into all right we're well over an hour um i got one more thing to do Again, another um, topic which, which, which will probably become uh, a broken off clip, which I, which I alluded to before. Um, I'm not going to try and make this quick, but kawaii, right? Kawaii, kawaii, kawaii. Okay. Okay. So um, first off, first off, before that, um, I found just, you know, the, the last episode um, talking about, hold on one second. One second, one second, let me load this up just to make sure I know what the fuck I'm talking about. 
Um, is this what? Ah, uh, yeah. So, um, before that, um, uh, before I talk about Kauai, um, there, for, for the fellas, I'm sorry, there's a interesting video, um, about Japanese girls, uh, talking about what's attractive, um, to them, um, how to date a guy, how to date a Japanese girl, sorry, according to Japanese girls. Um, uh, for me, I found this information, I would say interesting for guys and some of the girls there, let me see, there's kind of one, two, three, I think four groups of girls, um, they're like, uh, I think, uh, how do I categorize these? One or two of them are maybe not that experienced with guys. Is is one group I would say is not that experienced with guys, right? But um, yeah, actually, most of these girls are not going to be my type at all. So, <laughs> but um, two groups seem to be very young. Um, though they're all young, but 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 two groups, especially young, maybe not that experienced, especially one group, you'll know who I'm talking about, one pair. They're just talking that fantasy. But um two of them seem like they have some dating experience. You know, and just so listen to that, I would say, and get a feel for, you know, how a Japanese woman wants you to handle her, I would say. You know taking the lead but not being too forceful you know not really it's not really like a lady's first kind of situation dating a japanese woman generally speaking you're supposed to not again it's kind of like a delicate balance between being manly if you will and, and walking in front of her but also considering her at the same time um you know um yeah, so just just keep that in your head. I won't go into deep into. I watched it a few. It just popped up in my timeline a few days ago. Um, I thought like, okay, this is kind of helpful advice for someone coming to Japan looking for love. You know, sorry, ladies, I don't really have anything for you right now this time. But if it does pop up, I'll try my best to accommodate. But finally, let's talk about kawaii, right? And like I said previously, the you know the image of kawaii I think for foreign people um, living outside Japan is gonna be different than the expectation of uh, your typical Japanese person or foreign person living in Japan like me. So um, to do this, two main pieces of content that I used to kind of illustrate this was uh, first. Um, looking at, I think, a video of, I think in, in Japanese, I Googled kawaii something, something. I forgot what, what I Googled. No, no, I think I Googled in English kawaii something, and it popped up Harajuku stuff, right? And so the dark side of kawaii or something like that. You know, if you watched that first video, I can't remember exactly what the name is, you'll get a definite image of maybe kawaii. It's like some suicidal shit. It's all crazy, outlandish kind of stuff. Again, I'm not looking down. I'm not being condescending. It's just not my thing, you know? So, um, but, you know, it's kind of pali, kari, harajuku, kari, pami, pamu type genre of shit, you know, is what you're going to get if you Google kawaii in English. Now, uh, so I won't, I don't really don't need to get into that. You kind of have an image of that. I'm pretty sure if you're listening to this podcast, you kind of know what the fuck I'm talking about. On the other hand, I Googled in Japanese kawaii ranking, right? And an interesting article for me, which I'd like for you to look through is, um, uh, it turned, it was a ranking of the, I think top 10 or top 20, uh, kawaii actresses, I think it is. Sorry, ladies, again, it's, it's, it's strictly women. But I think for the most part, women use the term kawaii a lot more than men. So it is more like female-centered kind of word. Um, and so you'll, I'm sure it pretty much, if you see, if you, if you do, ha if you are a Japanophile, um, and, you know, or, you know, in deep into anime or deep into whatever, if you look at 
the ranking for these actresses, I'm pretty sure you'll think, you see, it kind of doesn't really 100% match with your image of what kawaii might be, right? Um, it's just cute. It's just a cute Japanese girl. You know, that's what it is. And and generally speaking, like, of course, there's a wide variety of things that are kawaii. You know, there are, there's fashion, there's like characters and things like that. But how you'll hear kawaii used in everyday life here in Japan is not in that context, right? Like, you might hear little kids use something like that, but as a grown motherfucker, you're not going to use it that way. And that's the main thing I want to really stress to you. You know, um, 90% of the time, you'll hear it used in an adult way, if you're an adult. And that's going to be in the context of, like, you know, dresses and fashion and, and, and looks and makeup and stuff like hairstyles and stuff like that like around the vein that these type of people that you see. So I want you to just keep that image with you, right? It's not Harajuku. You know, that's not kawaii for most. I mean, it, I'll just say it, that's not kawaii for the average Japanese person. The what is kawaii for the average Japanese person is, you know, shit related to the images you see um, in that video. Now, it is in Japanese, my apologies for it, but I just wanted to give you a visual representation, an illustration of that contrast. You know, what, and from my side, people living outside Japan think kawaii is versus what the average person inside Japan thinks it is. And that's what it is, right? It's their culture, so I'm going with the home team. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, but another thing I, I wanted to add, last thing, you know, more dating advice for you guys, bonus for you guys. So, um, using the word kawaii, right? Yeah, I'm sure, you, you know, be careful in your intonation. Like, if you're kawaii, things like, I don't really say that if you're a guy. Okay, don't say it to a girl if you're a guy. Generally speaking, I was thinking about it today, like, how if I were single, like, how I would use the word. My advice would be, don't really use the word kawaii to a woman over 27. 27, maybe 26 to be safe. I know it might sound really specific age, but I'm using it for a reason. Um, 26 and over don't, don't, don't really use the word kawaii because that's like a full grown woman at that point in time, uh, generally speaking. Um, I would use kire, you know, kire, kind of. Um, if you do use kawaii for like a woman, you can you can use kawaii, but not to the person, not like you're a kawaii person. I would use kawaii like to give compliment of some feature, like your hair is really kawaii. Oh, that outfit is really kawaii. Your earring is kawaii. Something like that. Some feature be. If you're dating someone, you know, who's Japanese, generally. Um, of course, you know, Japan is a very indirect language. So if you say your hair is kawaii, they'll naturally understand that you're giving them a compliment and it'll hit its mark. But to say you're kawaii is a little bit too straight, too direct. And also a mature woman might not want to be called kawaii. To call her beautiful, call her pretty is more, see, might seem more age appropriate, right? And I know some women, especially 30 and over, get offended if a guy calls them kawaii. But again, using some feature, some aspect of them, calling it kawaii, I think is is, is something that, um, you know, casually, oh, you know, your earrings are kawaii or something like, in Japanese. Um, I'm not giving you pickup lines or anything like that, but just letting you know, like, what makes a, a woman feel good here. I think that's, like, a pretty important thing to know, right? Um, and also, one, oh, I just remembered one thing I was thinking about, like, as I was walking into work today. If you're on a date with a Japanese woman, don't give her that compliment at the beginning of the date, right? I would save that one for the middle or the end of the date. Why? Because it's a lot more meaningful. Like, you know, normally you might tell them, oh, you look pretty. Oh, you look cute tonight. But uh, in the in 
in Japan, for me, it would have a lot more impact later in the date after you've made some connection with the person. Because if you just say it in the beginning, I mean, yeah, you, you, I mean, in English, it depends on how, you, I don't know what your, what your relationship might be, but I'm just imagining an imaginary date. You know, you look nice. It would be fun. Oh, nice outfit or something. It's fine. It's very casually, but to actually give that stronger compliment, I would save that later. You know, um, taking notice of something, you know. Um, but again, it's a kind of indirect language, indirect uh, society. So you saying, you know, sincerely, oh, wow, your hair is really, really kawaii, you know, or something like that. It hits his mark a lot more than any give you draws no <laughs> no um it hits his mark a lot more than it would at the start of a date so that's my tip my pointer try it out you know in your dating life here in japan hopefully hopefully it helps get you some loving helps you find a person you won't spend all your time in, in a danchi by yourself doing push-ups trust me it's not fun so, okay. All right, y'all. Um, this is another, ooh, 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 ooh. this is a humdinger of an episode, an hour and a half. I Longer than I thought it would go. So, but a lot of good stuff. Again, be on the lookout for it chopped up on YouTube. Um, I'll try and label it properly. You know, if you don't want to repeat the, all of the content, but if you know, please don't just click on it. Okay. <laughs> watch it. If you're going to watch it again. Um, and I'm, I'm going to try and make some, you know, library kind of, playlists uh related to this shit i'm gonna do something so so all right y'all let me get up out of here i've been talking long enough let me finish this beer and get my ass to bed i'll let you next time peace